Hello again, everyone. Uh, uh, three great presentations. Um, I'm joined by uh, Bill French, uh, as well as George Vetrovec. Uh, great to see both of you. Ziad uh, couldn't make it today, so uh, we'll have to answer all your COVID questions on our own, I guess. And um, I, I want to, <laughs> thanks, George. Um, actually, I, we have a question in the Q&A, and I, I, I want to maybe start with Bill. Um, the, the question from our friend Ivan Rokos, uh, giant in the field, obviously, uh, is about stat transfer initiatives and how do we reduce the false transfers that don't go to a uh, STEMI receiving hospital into the cath lab? Do we have a strategy for that? Uh, Bill, maybe you want to tackle this? Oh, you're muted, Bill. Unmute yourself, please. Thank you. You Can you go. hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thank you, sorry. In your previous uh, session, you actually discussed the false positive rate. In Los Angeles County, it's roughly 50%. So we have a major problem there. Some of us believe that transmission of the electrocardiogram is absolutely necessary from the field to make sure that we can sort out as the best we can uh, with the uh, uh, EMS help of, is this patient truly a STEMI? And just to point out a, a small study that was done with three cardiologists reading uh, STEMI electrocardiograms, the consensus is only about 70% that you get a lot of older patients ECGs that are very difficult to interpret. So we need to have kind of everybody in the process. The straightforward ones are gonna get called appropriately, but there's a whole bunch of others that we need help. And I think transmission of the ECG is part of that solution. Uh, George, any comments uh, from Virginia? No, I, I think I think the concept is great. I think there are always going to be, you know, overreads, underreads, and that's the price you pay for improving the care for the appropriate patients. Uh, I think that one of the things throughout this is the we have a state STEMI group that meets, and and there is an attempt to get education too if there's a consistent uh, problem. Great. Um, I want to ask you, George, um, your presentation about cardiogenic shock, and um, we're talking with the EMS community. What, what are some of the things that should be recognized early, or, and what are some of the pitfalls in recognizing cardiogenic shock as a first responder? Well, I, I think the really key thing is recognizing the hypotension, but coupled with that, there's hypotension that you can quickly reverse, and then there's poor perfusion. So if the patient has clinical evidence of, of limited perfusion, cold extremities, model, so forth, then I think that's a, a, I think a, an in, a piece of information that's very important, and particularly if um, it may be, and I don't know how organized you are, and most centers aren't, but I think California has a lot better organization than most of us have. If you can identify that, it may be appropriate to not only take the patient to a STEMI hospital, but one that uh, manages cardiogenic shock. And there are some STEMI hospitals, there are some hospitals that actually do more than just STEMI management. So that may be an important decision, part of that tree. Bill, same thing? Yeah, Los Angeles County does have a, a, a early stage study to uh, in certain areas of the county to send some of these patients to three, four, or five hospitals that would uh, be considering ECMO or other higher level devices uh, early on. We really need some data. Of interest, George, though I must say in your lecture, which I enjoyed tremendously, and I hope you could send us a slide set here, is the Impella just seems to be the ideal tool that is accessible, uh, is easy to put in, and gives you the hemodynamic benefits we just need a randomized controlled trial that's powered appropriately. I think there's one about to start fairly soon. So uh, it's, it's on the cookbook. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's excellent. Yeah. Um, Bill, back to you real quick. Um, you mentioned all these things that we're doing in the lab, and it has been an amazing transformation over the last 10, 15 years with some of the tools that we have now. Um, but one simple thing was just radial access. Uh, any comments for the EMS folks about should they be checking the radial pulse up front? Do they, is there something that they can do to help us out in the lab even before they get to the lab? Well, that's a great question, actually. Um, 
you know, it's it's so ubiquitous now that we're using the radio that it sometimes doesn't matter if it's small or large, uh, we tend to tackle it and, and give it a try. Uh, so uh, I think the proof is gonna be in the pudding. I'd rather make sure that the patient's hemodynamically stable and other therapies are given and so forth. I think the radio is pretty simple to define for us in, in the cath lab. Okay. And George, um, a question in the chat, uh, in the key way, I'm sorry, is to come up about, you know, what, what about refractory VF? Should we take those patients to the cath lab if they've already, if they've had mechanical CPR? Um, you know, what, what should we do with those patients? Those are very difficult patients to manage. I know we struggle with them. If, if there's been an EKG and it's pretty clear that they have an acute myocardial infarction, then I think you can make a case for doing it. I don't think there's any overwhelming uh, data, but the problem is, is that uh, if you just take patients with a cardiac, cardiac arrest to the cath lab, whether or not they have EKG changes or myocardial infarction, you wind up with uh, at least the most recent study suggesting it, it doesn't really make a difference. I think where it makes a difference is in someone who has an infarct that may be a reasonable patient. Now, the Japanese have done a lot of work with actually doing ECMO in the field to try to support those patients and they report some good findings, um, but that's a little bit different situation than, than we have. Bill? Yeah, the pivotal trial in Los Angeles County will be the refractory V-fib patient, and then hopefully it will progress into cardiogenic shock. So the only hope here is ECMO, I think, at this moment, because Impella is not going to have any value here. You, you, you need to sustain the patient more directly. And, and we hope there'll be some benefit to this, but the handful of patients who are going to get studied, it's going to take a long period of time to get adequate data, I think. Yeah, I want to refer to Ziad's um, presentation too, because um, you know COVID nineteen has been a real challenge, and we saw the same drop, uh, about a thirty to forty percent drop in our acute MIs during the real surges in COVID. Um, you know, I think I think there's a lot of logistical challenges associated with COVID, as we've all learned. Um, any comments or uh, tips and tricks, maybe to to get get us through? As I noticed that our STEMI volumes are back to normal again. Um, and maybe comment on that as well, but really about the challenge of COVID uh, from your own perspectives at your institutions. Uh, I guess I'll take it. Um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a big challenge. I think no one really understood all the issues and there were limits of PPE for staff. So those were a couple of big barriers early on. Um, I think that what we learned is, is that um, you're going to take some of these patients to the lab thinking they have a heart attack, as you saw, and they're not going to have the traditional heart attack to fix. But for the ones that have a, a lesion that is treatable, they're going to benefit from reperfusion. So I, I think in patients who present that look like a myocardial infarction, it's not an easy way to make the discrimination and they need to go to the cath lab. Hopefully your cath lab has PPE and so forth to support patients. So uh, the workers. So uh, one thing that's critical, I think, is that you can do everything you can to try to keep the patient from arresting in the cath lab or have to have urgent intubation. I think that's one of the things that increases the risk of, you know, COVID spread and so forth. So that's just a, a thought. The other thing that's happened is that I think one of the reasons the numbers are rising is people were afraid to come to the hospital. And I think that was uh, sort of unfortunate. And then most places showed an increase in cardiac arrest and a lower incidence yeah. of myocardial infarction going to the hospital. And I think everyone has a suspicion of what that really was. So those are my thoughts. You know, in, in retrospect, uh, COVID is a virus. You know, it was a bad yeah. virus. It is a bad virus. And if you take pr protective action, you can do anything safely for everyone. And I think that's the message we learned. It took us uh, a while to get ahead of that, but the whole idea of taking the precautions with appropriate PPE uh, supplies and so forth uh, really safeguards the entire uh, system actually, including the staff in the cath lab. Are you guys seeing a lot of delays in your uh, door to balloon times or encounter to balloon times during the COVID era? 
Oh, yes. I mean, everyone has to be tested. I, I go a little crazy about that. I mean, I think they should meet him in the front door and just test them, right? And oh, God, we go around and around on this. But uh, well, I'm out in the parking lot waiting for the patient, you know, with the nurse <laughs> to, have to put it in their nose. So it's just that, uh, yes, there's, that everyone had delays almost, uh, you know, and the sicker was even more delays. But uh, and then the other problem comes after the case, if you don't have a bed, a certain type of bed that's available. Yeah. Now the cath lab is tied up with the patient that we can't find a bed in. So on both ends of the equation, uh, we got all kinds of issues. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think it's a real challenge. And, uh, and I, I think we have all seen more delays. I think we're getting better though. And I think some of the, some of the concerns have, have, have lessened. And as, as I think you say, like Frenchy, you know, it is a virus and you protect yourself and, and it works. As I said, the, probably the biggest risk is really related to either um, cardiac arrest and, and trying to intubate a patient because that does aerosolize a lot. Okay, I'm, I'm, going to I'm, I'm going to tackle two questions before we have to break, but uh, the first question from the chat is about uh, should patients with right ventricular failure and at the time of a STEMI, should they just come up with ECMO or, or what should we do with those patients? Uh, I will take that. I, I I actually saw that in the chat. I thought it was refractory, refractory uh, VF, but yeah, anyway. I'm sorry, yeah. Refractory VF, but right ventricular failure, I'll just make a quick statement. Yeah. Most of those patients can be gotten through it by fluid volume uh, challenges initially, but for the patient who persistently has low cardiac output, and one of the secrets is that they get a left side of the impella and they continue to do poorly and you do a right heart cath, you realize they're not filling the, uh, the right ventricles failing. And there are there is a right ventricular um, impella device. device. There are other ECMO-like devices that can support the right ventricle. Yeah. Um, the question in the chat was about refractory, I'm I sorry. think refractory VF yeah. and should they all go to the cath lab with ECMO? Um, many, to, uh, you know, I think some of them are in different stages. Usually they yeah. arrest, re-arrest and re-arrest. And I, I tend to take them unless they're severely acidotic. And uh, Bill, maybe the last question here is about uh, CT surgery. Um, do you want to comment uh, on this about uh, the requirements for CT surgery? Yeah, I think the day of, I think we bypass bypass surgery. <laughs> I, I think it's over. I, I think uh, I left a slide out that uh, shows the question from the fellow, should we call the surgeon? And my answer is no. We're not calling the surgeon anymore. Those days are gone. Yeah. We have a handful of patients that need cardiac surgery or less than a handful. I think it's just the revolution's underway here. It's not gonna stop. We're going forward in the actions in the cath lab. Final comment there? No, I don't have any other comments. All right, great. Um, I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining us today. We're gonna go on a break. Uh, till 1035. So we'll see everyone at 1035. Uh, George and Bill, thanks again for the great presentations and joining us live today. Have a great day.